like you to turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 6 this morning. And the last time we got together, we were looking at these opening verses of this chapter and talking about how in this chapter, God teaches us as believers who know that they're justified by faith alone from chapters, we learn that from chapters 3, 4, and 5, why it is that God has saved us and what God's made us in Christ, justified, redeemed. Uh, he's uh, imputed his righteousness to us. He's forgiven us of all of our trespasses. We are, we are made into saints of the Most High God. And so Paul starts in chapter 6 by saying, these things that are true of you because you've been identified with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection, because that's true of you now in Christ, now we don't have an, ex an excuse to continue in sin. So we're going to continue in our studies. Again, last time we saw that we don't have an excuse to continue to live like unbelievers because God has made it possible for us to say no to sin and the death and the destruction that sin brings. There are consequences for sin. So God isn't, hasn't made us as believers unable to sin. I mean, that's, some people want to believe that they've been made uh, perfect as far as sinless in their behavior as well as saved to go to heaven. When they got saved, that God saved them from, from the power of sin by just taking away the sin nature. And so they don't, they don't have to, they don't sin anymore because God saved them from the effects of sin. But the Bible doesn't tell us that. The Bible tells us instead that he saved us from the penalty, from the wages of sin, by Christ dying in our place, us being identified together with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. Uh, for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him, in whom you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that you believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. We're, we've been made one with Christ, identified with him in his death, burial, and resurrection. We're going to read these opening verses and see Paul's argument about, shall we continue in sin? That question. What, if, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. We should not serve sin, right? There's some things that we know about what God has made us and who God has made us in Christ that are to prevail, override in our thinking whenever the desires and lustful pleasures uh, come into our mind we need to say no to those mental attitude sins and those other uh, temptations to, to turn our back on the truth and walk in darkness. We need to put that off and say that's not who we are. We shouldn't continue to walk in darkness as unbelievers because we've got some light. We know some things. We have some truth. And the, that knowledge of the truth is part of the power that God has given us to walk as saints should walk. Uh, we are to, God has given us this information about how he saved us and what he's made us and who we're made in Christ and that's what empowers us to be who God's made us to be is that knowledge that we have a choice. We can by faith put off those things. The way we're taught to deal with our old sin nature is to first recognize who God has made us in Christ, and then we can walk in our true identity by faith. So it, it's a process of just take one, first it's knowledge for us. You know, we look at it and we realize, oh, okay, that's, 
that sounds nice. I like the way that sounds about what God's going to be in Christ. Oh, yeah, that, that's what the Word says. I mean, I've read it in many verses. He's saying the same thing. But then we need to go to the place with it where we're thankful for it. And being thanksgiving helps make that a, an a, something we are have value and esteem for that he's made us. We value it. We love it the way God loves it. We have affection and response to God and love and gratitude for what he's made us. God has made his enemy into his child that he shares the inheritance of the Lord Jesus Christ with, that he's given us this, because of his grace, he's given us this capacity to have this security of knowing that whatever happens to us when we die, I mean, whatever happens that causes us to die, we don't know what it's going to be, but we know that we don't have to fear the sting of death as an unbeliever because we have a hope of a resurrection body one day. Being, and that God has, has given us the assurance that when our spirit departs our body, our soul and our spirit leave, to be abs absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Paul has a desire to, said he had a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. We have that, not only the security of knowing that when we die, far better is our choice, but we realize that, I mean, is our, our gift now from God. But we learn to value what he's given us in his son and appreciate it. And that's when these things become Wait a minute. That's who I. That's who I am. That that. When you bounce these things around in your thinking long enough, God, the Holy Spirit's job is to make it real in your thinking. It's not your job. And these truths come in, and they build an edifice of doctrine in you, and you realize there's strength when you go into that doctrine and and put it on in your mind, like putting on the armor. You, that's what it is to put it on, is to. Take inventory, wait a minute, this is what God says he's made me. I'm thankful for those things. I love those things better than the things that the world has to offer. I choose to walk in the light that God has given me to walk in. So it's a, it's a transition from knowledge to a faith walk. Believe in God. Believing what the book says is real about you more than even what you know from your behavior. Who you are. Because behavior is normally the course of this world attack, you know, bombarding you, and your emotions getting confused about what truth is, and you believing the lie that those things are better for you than what God has to offer, and going after those things that the world desires and, and takes comfort in. To God says some things that don't appeal to the flesh, but when you learn the truth of God's word, those things bring stability and to your life, peace, comfort, strength, patience, the ability to endure hardness, the capacity to be able to stand for the truth, all those things come from the light and the truth of the word of God, and they're much better than anxiety, depression, fear, being in, in despair, feeling hopeless and confused, right? There's nothing that, that, none of those things feel good, but that's what the, what the lie has to offer to anybody who's willing to believe it and embrace, and, and embrace those, the lies of the world and the course of this world. But God has some truth that brings stability into our lives, but he doesn't, God is a God who doesn't force his way upon our free will. So as believers, we have an option to choose to believe and walk in this truth and have power over sin in our life because it brings death and it brings destruction to our lives. Or not. It's up to you. It's up to you to believe each one of us as believers. So we can't use this. Last time we talked about, you know, the saying, uh, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. And a lot of people use that as a way to say, Everything that I do, don't look at what I do and the way I behave. And don't let that fool you, because I am a believer after all. That's a way of excusing behavior and saying, I may be a big sinner, but I'm saved by grace. 
And there's another way of looking at it to say, wait a minute, Paul says, what, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Does that make God seem greater because the, we can sin just like we did before we were saved and, and, and that just magnifies God's grace? And the answer is no. God has given you a choice now. And we have a freedom. God has liberated us, emancipated us. He's given us freedom from the power of sin to control us. That if we choose to walk and put on the, the new identity God has given us in Christ, we have freedom over the power of sin to bring all those bad things into our life. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 2. I want you to, we're just going to talk a little bit about, we're going to look at a couple verses. You know, the sin, people want to use the excuse, yeah, I'm a Christian, and but I know the truth, you know, from studying Paul's epistles. Romans chapter 7 tells me I still, as a Christian, have an old sin nature. And so, don't expect too much out of me. Don't judge me. I still have an old sin nature. And excuse their sin in their life. Now, but I want you to look. God doesn't describe you that way. And the part of you that's identified together with the Lord Jesus Christ, your spiritual nature cannot sin. And it's only by your soul giving into the lusts and desires of your fleshly sin nature that you're going to continue in those things. But again, God gives you the free will, the choice to do what you want to do. One is going to give God glory. The other one is going to bring, re bring reproach on the body of Christ. We are an example to believers. If we live just like unbelievers, why, how, why would an unbeliever want what you have as a saint of the Most High God? Salvation of things that God's given you in Christ. 2 Timothy 2.3, if it doesn't have any practical benefit in your life, what good is it, bro? Right? And so 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3 tells us, Thou therefore endure hardness, as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, <clears throat> that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. So we are soldiers. God expects us to be strong uh, as believers. And um, I want you to go now to Colossians chapter 1, verse 12. Colossians 1, 12. We're supposed to look different, but I want you to see that God saved you, your spiritual nature, God considers to be his child. He doesn't consider your old sin nature to be his child. Uh, that was crucified and nailed to the cross with his son. Uh, Colossians chapter 1 verse 12 says, giving thanks unto the Father who hath made us Meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. And it goes on. The point I want you to see is God considers you one of the saints in light. This, those who have the light have been changed. That light has come into our spiritual nature. He's regenerated our spiritual nature and made his spiritual words able to live in us. We're different. We're part of the, you know, we've studied recently that we're new creatures in Christ. That God regenerated our spiritual nature and that the difference between a, a human with a spirit, soul, and body and an animal is an animal doesn't have a spiritual nature that's able to communicate with words. God can take his, his, the words of his, of his holy word, his preserved word, and those words can, when we take them in and believe them, have the power to save us and help us to walk as believers should walk. They can empower us, the, the words. An animal can't experience that. They don't have the capacity of a spiritual nature. And um, look with me at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. So we're... The Word of God calls us saints in light that He's delivered us from the power of darkness. Colossians chapter, I mean, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 4. 
God considered us, considers us to be different now that we've trusted in Christ. I want you to start reading with me um, in verse 4. Ye are not, or sorry, sorry. Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as ye also do, or even as, as also ye do. So we are saints of light. We are children of light. Verse 5 says, You are all the children of light, and the children of the day, you are not of the night, nor of darkness. So we're different. We're not to mingle with children of darkness and try to blend. We are different. We are children of light. The only difference is we have the light and the truth in us, working in us. That doesn't make us superior because we are those who did something. That makes us the children of God because of the work that God did upon us. And we have the privilege of the light of God living in us. We are His children. We are children of light. We're children of the day. We shouldn't live as though we're still in darkness. We should live like we have some light and truth to walk in, as God has equipped us to be able to do by regenerating it. That spiritual nature that we talked about that didn't communicate with words was dead because it was not functioning for the purpose that God created our spirit to work, to God created us with a spiritual nature so that he could have communion and communication with us. You remember Adam and Eve. Before they fell, they walked in the garden with the Lord. After the fall, they hid from the Lord. They were in darkness. They, they hid from the light when he came to walk with them. And they realized the guilt had driven them away from his light into darkness and were fearful of of him. But God did something. He called them. He wooed them back to himself. And he killed the animal and gave them skins to cover their nakedness. And he started to reveal the plan of redemption in the scriptures. And, and God understood that when he gave man a free will, that he would have to send his son, one, the second person that God had, would have to die in the place of all men so that he could give us his righteousness and eternal life and deliver us from the power of sin so the walk of faith is all about learning who god has really made us in christ and learning to accept that as our true identity relaxing and who god has made us to be in christ notice that's not fighting to put it on but it's relaxing into it and that's what faith does Faith says, you know, God said it. He's, he's the all-powerful one that created the world and the universe and holds everything together. If he says this is what's going to bring strength, truth, stability, I mean, if, he's gonna, if it's going to bring comfort and peace, it's, it's what's good for me, then I, I'm just going to take the dare of faith to believe it. he's right and walk in it. And if he says this is who I am and his word, even though I know that my sin nature still desires certain things that aren't good for me, but I have to put that off. That doesn't mean that, that my sin is what defines who I am anymore. Because God says, I'm a child of light. This is who I am. So what relaxing into it is just saying, okay, I'm a child of light that still lives in a body of flesh that's going to try to tempt me and try to destroy me. But God says, I'm free to make the choice. I don't have to be that way anymore. That's liberty. And that's just relaxing into who God says he's made you in Christ.
He's the one that lend the power and the strength to make that real in your life. He's the one, he's the force behind the Word of God to make those things real when we believe them. So when we believe that this is who we really are, and as long as we allow the light and the nourishment of the Word of God to come in and feed who we are in Christ, that nature is going to become stronger and dominant in our thinking. But if we starve that part of us by choosing to put the Word away and, and not read it and, and take inventory of what God's made us day by day and renew our minds daily, then pretty soon we're going to lapse into just being consumed and controlled by our sin nature, the emotions, and suffer the, the fruit of sowing to our flesh. Be not deceived, God is not mocked whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Go to Colossians chapter 2 with me. It's a walk of faith. The walk of the believer is a walk of faith. It's not you mustering up the capacity to serve God. It's you realizing your true identity and just relaxing into that. Being who God's made you in Christ. That's all. Colossians 2, verse 6. Don't fight it. Believe that, that God said it. It's true. And let that part of you be who you are. Uh, verse 6. As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. How did you receive him? You believe that Christ died for your sins, right? You rested in what he did on the cross as the way that he saves and gives eternal life to everyone freely by his grace. You trusted in him to do what he said he promised to do, and that save you by just relaxing and believing, I can't do anything to save myself. All I can do is rest in what he did on my behalf to save me. The illustration putting the, you know, the dollar bill and saying that, you know, this is God offering salvation, I want you to take it as an example of a free gift. That's what salvation is, is just taking eternal life from the table. It's, on, it's in front of you, God. Put it in front of you. Oh, you open his word and you look at the verses. For by grace you saved through faith in that, not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast in it. And you just simply, okay, I believe that Christ died for my sins according to the scriptures. And that he was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. I, I, I trust that's what I need to believe. God says that's all I need to do to be saved is trust that his son died to pay for my sins and receive the gift of eternal life. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. The, the walk's the same way. Is saying, okay, when I believe that Christ died for my, my sins, God saved me and he made me something different. He regenerated me, my spiritual nature, God the Holy Spirit <coughs> lives in my spiritual nature. And now the, the, if I just believe that God has identified me with his son, like his word says, I can walk by faith in that identity and God will help me to walk as a saint of the Most High God should walk. Just believing that's who I am, and that's that's who I should be. And so the faith walk is the same trusting God's word to save to save you from the penalty of sin is how God's word saves us from the power of sin in our daily lives. We just believe who He said we are in Christ and walk in that truth. And the way to walk in the truth is to read it and renew our minds with it every day. But if you it's your free will. You have to either respond to God's love and offer of, of salvation from the power of sin in your daily walk, or you can reject it and choose to walk under the, um, the tyr tyranny of, of the power of the sin nature to continue to dominate you. Most people don't want to be dominated. Most people don't want to, to have something control them, and yet often we give in to that part of our nature that will only result in death and destruction. Um, salvation is justification by grace through faith. It's believing Christ died for your sins and God doing the work to save you. Our walk is sanctification by grace through faith. Separated as holy unto God is what the word sanctification means. And both, though, are the work of God when we exercise our free will to believe God and allow His power to work in us. God wants a willing response to his love. He doesn't want to force us to follow him or serve him. 
And that's the main thing. God didn't force his way upon us or else he'd have a bunch of robots. So the way God works is he gives us the choice and lets our free will do the respond in faith to believe him and, and, and respond to him or choose not to. He wants a loving response to him. That's what he wants from us. He doesn't want to force us into submission. Now, the last time we talked about, you know, we talked already this morning about our spiritual nature being regenerated, made alive. Go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. So that means if, our, if we have been, God the Holy Spirit living in us gives life to our dead spirit, by the word when we trusted it when we got saved and then that means that the word can live in us now and God can lead us and uh, by faith by the truth of his word living in us um, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and beginning in verse 9 we've seen this passage recently so we're going to just brush over it real quick uh, 1 Corinthians 2 9 but as it is written I had not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man, the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. I want you to, you know, when you read that, you should think how the Spirit, the Word of God, searches. Uh, there's a verse over in Hebrews saying, um, that the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to dividing of soul and spirit and of the joints of, and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. That's how the Word of God works on us. It's the only book when you read it, it reads you. It's like a, it's God's surgical instrument that helps diagnose us and correct us where, where our weaknesses are and where our faults are. It's like a computer you run a program in it, and when it, you know, after you load it, if it develops a vi virus, you just delete everything and reload it. And that's what the Word of God does. You just reload it, the program. You read it, and oh yeah, that's who I am. That's who God's made me in Christ. That's where my stability and security comes from. It comes from God's Word. I need to let that run in my thinking. Uh, verse 10, God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of man, save the Spirit of man that is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no, no man, but the Spirit of God. So the things, the third person of the Godhead, God the Holy Spirit, knows the things of God, he's God, and we have a spiritual nature, we know the things from, of another man by words, communicating those things. So God, the Holy Spirit, takes his spiritual word, his word, and communicates the things to God to our spirit. Verse 12, For we have received not the spirit of the world, small s, but the spirit which is of God. Now that's talking about the word of God. It would be a capital S if it was talking about the Holy Spirit in this verse, this context. That we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Good point here. Just being baptized by the Holy Spirit doesn't mean you know everything about the Word of God. How do you know the things about the Word of God? From the small s, the Word of God Spirit, the spiritual book. That's why it has a small s in this verse. How do you receive the things uh, uh, that are freely given unto us of God? By reading it here in a book. Not by the Holy Spirit forcing it into your understanding not by his power overwhelming us and making us have the words in us, but by us taking in the spiritual words of this book and then our, again, our free will being exercised, taking in the words and, and us conforming to the words of this book, what they have us, for us to understand and believe. Not forcing our way upon the word of God, but letting the word of God have its way with us. 